guys, please welcome Jeff. Thank you so much, Jeff. <laughs> Turn it on. There you go. All right. So thanks for coming out tonight, guys. Uh, and thanks to Ed and Lawagon for organizing this wonderful occasion. Um, so just for those of you who don't know me, just a bit about me first. Uh, I moved over to London last summer in July, and I was looking to basically move away from my career as a professional swimmer. And basically after Rio, I was feeling quite lost. Um, I, I, I had just achieved this dream that I had been working towards for my whole life, and I was wondering what I was going to do with myself. And it came to last April when I decided to basically stop swimming um, and devote my time elsewhere. And to, as my mom used to say, swimming is going to end one day, and you should probably know what you're going to do after. Uh, we hear a lot today about uh, athletes out there who who finish or get injured and fall off this cliff. And I didn't want to be that uh, person. Um, so basically, I moved to London. And I was looking for a job. And it was hard coming over here in the summer. Things are quiet. People are on holiday. Uh, but I wound up with an opportunity in private equity. And it was an interesting experience, but at the end of the day, it, it wasn't for me. But how I landed up at, well, at La Wagon uh, and learning to code was basically, I was doing some research into a CRM solution for the company. And it came up that you know one of the possible solutions was to build something. And I had no idea. I didn't have any technical skills. Uh, it was just really a, a completely new field to me. I had taken a coding course at Stanford, uh, which is where I studied for, for university. And I got a C plus in my coding class, uh, not the C++ that everyone else was talking about at Stanford. So this was something that I never saw as a possibility. Um, but yet, I came here with the spirit to explore and to push uh, my limits and learn something new. And I wound up uh, doing this nine-week coding boot camp with these wonderful individuals. And in just 10 days, we built uh, my first MVP. And there, uh, I picked up a new skill. Um, so before this, I was a student at Stanford. Uh, I was also competing for the team there in the NCAA. And for those of you who don't know what the NCAA is, it's the uh, US's Collegiate Athletic Association. And over there, it's a really, really big deal, uh, college sports. Um, I studied renewable energy, environmental science, and economics, uh, and politics. Um, and basically, throughout my whole life, I just wanted to be a swimmer. And so when I graduated, I went off and became a professional swimmer. And for two years, I was based in uh, Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan. And that served as my base, where I basically competed around the world, traveled around the US against the likes of people like Michael Phelps. Uh, that all just did not happen overnight. Uh, it took a lot of hard work. Uh, but before that, I was just your ordinary kid. Uh, I was a professional ironer um, with a dream to go to the Olympics. And as you can see here, I wasn't so enthusiastic about this potential uh, profession. Um, and so I, when I was 10, I watched Ian Thorpe swim uh, on TV at the Olympics. And thus, my Olympic dream was born. So all of this just doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of work that goes through. Uh, and I get asked all the time about what the Olympics was like. And in short, it was just like the movie Zootopia. Uh, athletes, people, tall, short, big, small, from all kinds of different ethnicities, all over the world with different opportunities and different stories. And to me, that is what captured the Olympics for me, um, aside from the time that I was waiting for a week to race and just stressed out of my mind. Uh, so that was essentially my Olympics experience right before my race. So at the end of the day, what the Olympics really is, is a roller coaster of emotions. And the name of the game is, is how do you manage those emotions and how do you prepare yourself to perform 
on the day that you've been training for, you know, as Olympians, as swimmers, track athletes, we all operate and live in, in these four year cycles. And so this was me at the uh, Olympic Games opening ceremony. And for me, it was just such a wonderful experience standing here with all these other people and to be able to talk about how we got there and all of that. So to get here, the question that we're going to be talking a lot about tonight is, how do we prepare to achieve? And it is my honor to stand before you today to share my experience. And hopefully, by the end of the day, you'll be able to walk away with some useful tools and tips that you can apply to your daily lives. So one of the first steps for success is to set yourself up with a schedule that will help you do that. And this was my university and this was my professional swimming uh, schedule where basically, as you can see, my university schedule was way more jam packed than my professional swimming schedule. And uh, one of the things that I've learned here is actually, you know, in terms of my ability uh, to, to, to execute and to succeed, surprisingly, even though I was doing way more at uni, um, my results, although I've naturally progressed, um, I was actually probably a lot more happier doing all of that uh, and filling my time. And so one useful tip that I have is to just remember Parkinson's law, which is basically the, work, the, the amount of work that you have will expand uh, in relation to the amount of time that you allot it in, in some cases. And sometimes when you have so much time to use, you add, end up adding to a simple activity uh, complexity uh, in organizations, maybe bureaucracy. Um, but in other occasions, it ends up just being stress, anxiety, procrastination. So that is one simple tip, is to use your uh, time efficiently and effectively. And just remember to be conscious and aware of how much time uh, you are allotting to individual activities. And basically, while I was at school, uh, at university, it was eat, swim, sleep, and study. And what I found, and the big lesson that I learned as a professional swimmer was that actually I felt rather empty with that extra stuff. And so the challenge is to be aware of these kinds of things. So how I like to first approach uh, any, kind of a, any kind of performance or any kind of pursuit to achieve a goal is mindfulness. Uh, who here is familiar with mindfulness? Okay, a few people. So what is mindfulness? In short, it is being present in the moment, uh, but having a gentle, gentle consciousness moving from one moment to another and not passing any judgment on what thoughts may arise, uh, your self-dialogue, um, the people who you interact with, uh, being aware of how you react to things, all of these kinds of things are what's called being mindful. And by making this a habit, you become naturally just more self-aware. You learn and become sensitive to things that you react well to. Uh, how do you, in the case of a coding boot camp or um, when you're studying for something, how do you best study um, and what works for you? And those, all of those things were some of the most common traits that I saw from people uh, interacting with people like Michael Phelps and, and talking to other to, to Olympic gold medalists and finding out what makes them tick and what makes them give them that, that special edge, essentially. And on top of that, and I think this is uh, really, really important uh, in life in general, is it, off it offers you um, an opportunity to reflect. And through that, you gain understanding and empathy for what others may go through. So because some of you haven't um, done any mindfulness before, I'd like to do a simple exercise. So just bear with me here. So I'd like all of you to take your left or your right hand and place it on your belly. Yeah. And I want you to bring your awareness to your breath. So breathe in through the nose and out through your mouth for a few breaths. Is the air going in through your nose and out through your mouth hot or cold? Okay. Now with that, 
I'd like you to close your eyes and stay focused on that breath. Now, as you're listening to my voice, the second tip I have here is to go through your senses. So what can you hear? And then what can you smell? Can you feel your feet against the ground and your sit bones in the chair? What can you taste? So moving from moment to moment and noticing and acknowledging different things that come up. So now gently bring your awareness back to your breathing. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And the last sense that you can go through is, what are you actually looking at? And so this is a simple tool that I would use to get ready to perform and be race ready. I remember when I was sitting in the call room before my race in Rio, and there I could hear like 20,000 people just through the next door. I was, I was shaking. And I'm supposed to know how to swim. This is what I would do basically every day you know, of my waking life. So use these tips. Um, if it's preparing for a talk like I did today, uh, if it's even just to start your day and get your day flowing, um, it's a really, really useful tip. So from that, with that awareness, we can go to goal setting. Now, a framework that I like to use is the SMART. It's the SMART acronym. And what S stands for is specific. And, but what does making specific goals mean? It basically means that you have to describe clearly what exactly you are trying to achieve and ask yourself the five W's. So what are you trying to achieve? Why is it important to you? Who is involved? Which resources do you need? And where is it going to happen? And answering these five things will help you make a SMART goal. M stands for measurable. And that means trying to figure out what metrics you're going to use to track your progress. And on top of that, these metrics have to be useful. Are they going to cause the certain result that you're looking for? Or are they just you know, something that adds to your ego? Uh, are they vanity metrics, I once read? A is for achievable. It's important to set goals that are going to stretch your capabilities, but not be so far out of reach that they're completely unattainable. So if you do have a long-term goal in the long run that you're trying to achieve, it's important to break those big, big goals into smaller steps and more uh, easily attainable goals that will eventually lead you to achieving that big vision that you have. But on top of that, in this stage of trying to ascertain what is achievable and what isn't, it's important to note down your process and what exactly, what actions you're going to do uh, that you are going to basically do every day in order to make your goal become a reality. R stands for relevant. That means, and this is really, really important, relevant goals mean something to you. So it's really important to ask yourself, what is its meaning? And in this way, you will basically be aware of what you're trying to do pretty much at all times. So when you're training for the London Marathon, for example, or it's the night before, and your mates ask you to come out for a few beers, you know exactly, uh, you have clarity with exactly what you're trying to achieve here. And therefore, it becomes easier to make certain sacrifices that may not be sacrifices in the end when you think about what you're trying to achieve. And for me, one of the hardest parts in my career has been to say no um, and being OK with that. And that includes social situations, like going, I mean, even going on holiday. University was especially hard. Uh, but nevertheless, because I had clarity in my vision and what I was trying to achieve, it made it easier. Maybe not less painful, but it made it easier to make a decision. So T stands for time bound. 
This is going to really help because it's going to set a date or a certain period of time, uh, near or far, for you to actually um, realize this goal. And this will help you prioritize more important things from others. And if you're struggling with one thing, it may mean that you can spend more time on that. That and it's also really fun uh, to work towards something. If you have no end date, it m might feel like you're just never going to achieve it. And, but that, that being said, some things you don't know uh, are, are unexpected. And it's important to be prepared for that. So this SMART acronym is, is important. But one caveat is that I don't think it should really, really be super rigid. One potential uh, problem with this is that it could make your thinking and what you're trying to achieve very, very rigid. And so when you don't achieve a goal, but you've significantly improved from where you were before, uh, sometimes that can lead to uh, unhappiness because you didn't achieve your goal like it was on paper. And for me, that was a really important lesson throughout my career. Uh, we know uh, with heartbreak, um, but only with some some added guide, guidance from my mentors, was it made more apparent to me that actually you know what I've achieved is significant. So that's also a really important factor. And underlining all of that, we we come to process. And when we talked about what was achievable earlier, process is key. And so here we have the end goal. And your end goal is underpinned by all of the smaller little goals and steps that you need to take in order to achieve it, your weekly and monthly goals and your daily goals. So for me, I kept a logbook. And that's maybe something that all of you can maybe do. Uh, maybe you guys keep a diary every night. But for me, for every practice, how I felt in the water was super important, something that may just sound trivial to a swimmer, but uh, we have some really interesting talks about how we feel in the water with each other. But one of the most important things is controlling the controllable. And I'm a really analytical person. And one thing I learned with one of my mentors is something so simple as controlling what I can control. I'm already a person who's, who gets super invested in whatever I'm trying to achieve. And, Overanalyzing and overthinking things can mean that I try to control things that really are just are out of my control. So that's important to remember. One strategy I used was to create three strategies every week for me to focus on. Uh, one example could be I'm trying to improve my dolphin kick, and I want to basically have my first 15 meters of every race be under six seconds. And the only way for me to do that was to improve my dolphin kick. So I set out myself one strategy and use verbs and actions in order to achieve these things. I will push off every single wall and dolphin kick three, or four, three, three times. And eventually, I progressed to five, to eight, and then to 10 times, such that pushing off every wall in the race and going 15 meters, holding my breath became a no-brainer for me. So that once you do that, it's really important to celebrate those achievements every week and reflect on that. Because by doing that, something so simple, you build this momentum. And you build a positive mindset. And you build a, a, a great attitude as well. Uh, and you end up becoming very grateful for all the things that you achieve in week in, week out. And when it comes to missing that end goal, it's not a total failure. Because there are so many little wins along the way that actually add up to a really, really great season or a really, really great year um, at work. And all of this can come from within you. It just takes time, a little bit of time every day, here and there, consistency giving 100% on days when you can only give 20%. So 100% of 20% is what I like to tell myself if I'm not feeling good. And just to give your best, and the key is consistency. So with people helping you and a bit of luck, uh, hopefully, 
you can achieve your goals. Um, but at the end of the day, it is never a given. And that's why celebrating your achievements is so, so important. So going away from today, what are some simple actions that you can take? First one is write down your goal on paper or your goals on paper. Just by simply doing that makes it become a reality right there. You're putting it on paper and it actually takes some kind of physical form rather than just being some kind of aspiration that you have in your head. Secondly, share those goals with people who you care about or people who seem interested, uh, people who met mentors, family members, your friends, anyone who might show that they are willing to help you. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Put your goals somewhere that is visible to you. That sounds, uh, it sounds a bit vain, but a good place to put it is on your bathroom mirror so that every morning when you wake up, you have something to remind you of what you are trying to achieve, whether it be that day or sometime in the future. Michael Phelps is really famous to have done this. Uh, and that's, some, that's one thing that I learned off of um, talking and talking to him and reading about him as well. Learning from your failures. This is, so, this is basically the most important thing out of all of this. Back in the day, I was so, so hard on myself. And uh, I took every failure as a label of who I was as a person. But as I matured uh, and with the appropriate guidance, I learned that failures actually increase your strength. Failures are actually what gets you to your destination. Because if you can learn from them, you don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And therefore, you can get closer to your destination. The tool in the middle is something that, well, I would hope all athletes use, but I think what a lot, a lot of athletes use, and that's visualization. So if you're basically, you want to become, so for me, what does being a chief technical officer look like? Although that's not my goal, but I'm someone who's new to the tech industry. I don't even know what that looks like. Uh, I could talk to people, figure out what, that's, what that actually entails, and I could visualize it for myself. So in the case of swimming, uh, one of the goals that I had was to go 48 seconds in the 100 meter freestyle. Um, and Initially, I would only do it maybe once a week because it's really quite taxing, but you can build this up. If you can't see exactly what you're going to look like when you're actually achieving this goal, it's important to focus first on what it's going to feel like. You can go through all that, that mindfulness stuff that we did earlier. Uh, smelling, for me, like the chlorine of the pool. What is it going to be like listening to the crowd going out? What is it going to be like with one foot on the block and, and, and feeling like the strongest I've ever felt before? What is it going to feel like? I, I would run. This one time, I sat with my um, sports psychologist, and he got out his phone. And my goal was to go 22 seconds in the 50 free. And he literally got me to sit down, visualize my race, and say it out loud exactly what I was doing. So I bend over, hold the block. The starting um, gun goes off. I push. I dive into the water. And my goal was to finish dead on 22 seconds and to go through that whole process. And that is something that maybe you can use if um, you're struggling to picture what you know, being the head of something is or uh, a new skill that you might have. So these are five simple tools that you can use. So with those tools, it's important to have the right mentality and the right mindset. And these are five, uh, five philosophies, maybe you could call it, that helped me along the way and that I learned. The first one is something that I learned at Stanford. Our coach used to take a real hands-off approach at Stanford. And that's be both a student. Well, at Stanford, it was be a student of the sport. And we were all like, what does that mean, coach? You, shouldn't you be teaching us? So actually, we had a lot of peer coaching at, at Stanford. And in the true university spirit, like we would 
um, research things in school, we would research the same things in swimming and improve that way because of his hands-off approach. Being both a student and master of, of your craft means that you're curious, you're always willing to learn. Um, but that being said, you're also being confident in what you know and you're, and, and you're sharing that with other people. The second one is from a professor at Stanford. Her name is Carol Dweck. Uh, and, that, and she talks a lot about the differences between uh, people, uh, people who have the growth mindset, people who don't and have a fixed mindset. The main thing is that people with the growth mindset have this belief that your ability is not tied to whatever is inherent within you. Your ability is basically determined by how much effort you put in, your willingness to accept challenge and, and to learn from those things. So that for me is uh, something that I like to try to remi remind myself every single day of whenever I face a new challenge. Get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Swimming is a really painful sport as I'm sure the other swimmer, two swimmers in the room know. Um, but this was a saying that we would always talk about in, in meetings right before we, were, we would go into a race pace set, which often meant, you know, not, not being able to walk after uh, a repetition in workout. But this means basically to embrace the challenge, embrace the pain. You know it's going to come. If you know, uh, if you're trying to go to a workout in the morning, but you haven't had very much sleep the night before, what are some things that you can do in order to motivate yourself from going? You can look at the goal in the mirror, or you can just remember and be mindful about how you feel after those workouts. You feel great, right? So that is how you're going to basically embrace the challenge because you know you're going to come out of the other end uh, having done something useful th that morning. Something I learned from Brene Brown is this I the idea about what courage means. Before, as an athlete, I always thought that to be the best swimmer I could be meant that I should never be nervous. I should never fear walking out into a stadium of 20,000 people. I should be strong. I should always be uh, performing at my best. But in reality, that is just impossible. So courage means basically to have fear. And just because you have fear does not mean that you are not courageous. And the two are very intimately linked. I'm not sure there's very many young people in here, but for me, I'm 27. I got to last July. I still feel a bit this way. What? I don't have any long-term goals. Where do you? When you don't know what to imagine and we, when you don't know what to you know, strive for, what do you do? Uh, so I learned this one from Oprah, of all people. Um, basically, when you're feeling that anxiety and you're feeling lost, it's just to come back to the present moment and just ask yourself, what is the next one thing, the one next right thing that you can do? And basically, that's how I wound up at, at, at the wagon. Uh, basically, on this internship, I was like, you know, all my peers are telling me I should take this job, uh, which they ended up offering me in the end. Not a, like I think one person who's sitting in the room told me uh, to to take it. Um, so to not take it, sorry. Uh, and I ended up not taking it. But basically, I asked myself this this question, and I don't know where this is going. But that's the kind of spirit that you should look to have uh, when you're facing these kinds of decisions. So some book recommendations I thought I might put in there. Mindset by Carol Dweck is an amazing read. The Happiness Equation by Neil Pasricha. Uh, the main th takeaway that I had from there is basically if you, are, you, you have all these things that you want to do or you're not happy with where you are at the minute, one golden rule you should follow is just to do before overanalyzing things. Otherwise, you're never going to get any of it done. And although I was super bad at coding, I chose to completely ignore that. And I went and did the uh, full stack coding boot camp in the end. And then the last one is probably not a very well-known book. It's called The Inner Game of Tennis. Um, the key thing with this book, and regardless of whether you're a tennis player or not, we're all here trying to learn new things and to become skilled at something 
that we haven't done before. And this book talks about how you actually get out of your own way and actually perform what you've try been trying to, to do. And a lot of times, basically, conscious trying uh, produces negative results. And uh, Timothy Galway talks all about this and how he uh, used this approach to teach his uh, tennis students. So I'll leave with this before getting to some Q&A. This is a poem that uh, a coach gave to me when I was 15. And uh, the bottom line is to check yourself and to hold yourself accountable to whatever you're trying to achieve. So thank you very much. Am I on? Jeff, wow. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Guys, can we, can we just celebrate this guy? Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. I mean, Jeff is so down to earth and humble for the whole nine weeks where we were together. Everyone, you know, they would ask him questions about the Olympics. They'd ask him about, you know, little details. And he's, he's too nice and doesn't like to talk about himself, um, which is a real trait to have, Jeff. But at the same time, we do want to know. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you some questions now, all right? Uh, you know, it, it, it probably is quite personal. By the way, that was amazing. Absolutely nice. amazing. So many good takeaways for us from, from references to personal experiences. Um, so thank you. I was not expecting that so deep. But um, I, 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 let's, let's go back. Like, how do, I just want to get more of that emotion. The, you know, you've done all this work. You said you were two years in training. Uh, well, uh, it was well, two years spent in Michigan, but like my whole life to... Yeah, your whole life, exactly. Yeah. But those two years, like, how much... How, did you see your friends? Did you... How, how did it feel, you know? Did, how was that, that, that compensation versus am I doing the right thing? Am I going to make it, you know? And, you know, the whole challenge. Did you know you were doing the right thing? Did you, did you just absolutely love every minute of it? Or for, the, for the most part... For them, I will say for the most part, for, as an answer to all of those questions, yeah. for the most part, I thought I was doing the right thing. For the most part, basically, yeah, I mean, I, I tried to strike the, the greatest balance that I could, and I wouldn't change uh, my approach. Hindsight is twenty twenty, um, But I do believe that yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, of course. I mean, up, you can say that now, but at the you know, I've got friends who are rugby players and, and, and a cricketer, and a lot of the time, their frustrations, they come with it and they question what they're doing. I but having spent the time with you, like, your focus is crazy. Like, honestly, this guy, and we'll talk about, like, the, the, you know, being out there on your own. You're, apart from the relays, you're on your own. You're, you're yeah. walking out there, and you're, it's just you against these seven, is it eight lanes in a pool or something? I don't know. Right? And, Olympics, and but so when you're on, on your own like that, and you've set these goals for you, just like I was saying earlier, I had to make some like high school, uh, university. That was so tough for me because those are key years where you're, you know, you're spending time socializing. You're just being a normal kid and. That was really hard for me to to have to balance this kind of dream with meaning, ma maintaining some sense of normality, um, and I suppose that's why I'm sitting here today, but, not swimming anymore. Yeah, well, maybe <laughs> again, but you know, I don't know. You've probably heard this from everyone, but so you said Jeff said there were four and a half billion people, okay, that watched Rio, okay. I remember watching it with my now wife, and watching their montages. I don't know about you guys, but it's like you cry. You know, you watch, the montages are crazy. Like the, the, the interviews with the, with the competitors, with the fans, with their families, because it's such a huge achievement. It's such a long wait. And uh, how did you feel? Like, right, you know, at the close, you know, when it was closing, closing ceremony, what were you going, there, going, what was going through your mind? Like, did you want the next one? Were you just enjoying, were you lapping it up? Were you crying, was it, what was going on? I'd love to know, because that closing ceremony was pretty emotional for all of us on watching it on TV. I actually really don't have very many photos from that situation, because I really wanted to make it a point to just lap it all up, because uh, it may not ever come again. And I distinctly remember, yeah, I mean, 
it feels like it was just yesterday. I can feel like the the kind of vibrations of the of the air in the stadium walking out. It was. You know, sometimes when something like really big happens, you feel a bit numb. You just don't know what to kind of what you should do. And in some respects, I felt that way. Uh, but as much as I I could, I tried to stay present. It's it, well, Jeff. It's it's great. We've got a bit of personal detail out of Jeff there, but <laughs> he's too he's too very he's a very very down to earth guy. But <laughs> no, it's an incredible thing. Can we can we just go on a few, uh, just to do you know a few relative things for the audience as well, just on on day-to-day -day life and how we can replicate. I know you've gone to town on, on, on helping us here, which is really kind of you. But like, um, at the wagons, so at the boot camp that we do, for us staff, it's a real sense of satisfaction to watch everyone go from day one to day 45. It's uh, nine weeks later, 45 working days. It, it, it's crazy, the ups and downs. It's nothing to what you've gone through. Um, how, how much does diet, exercise, mindfulness, for, for, for example, and all of that affect your long-term success? I don't mean financially and whatnot. I just mean happiness, so to speak, and, and, and being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So, it's like, uh, so as an athlete, we're, for all those things, we're taught to treat simple things like what you eat, what you're drinking, when you eat, how much you're eating, but just in general, like staying healthy as like the building block for your performance. And in sport, it, it's much more obvious because you're putting, through, putting your body through like terrible things. <laughs> and in that respect, we, we build a real strong appreciation for attention to that kind of detail. But in reality, it transitions over into work life, into everything, because it's I mean, essentially how you function as a human being. It's the building blocks to your ability to get up, go to work every day, and to do a good job. So it's super important, because it could mean the difference between you know, having enough energy to produce good work output or not. I mean, even something as simple as hydration could mean that your brain just doesn't operate as, as well as it you, should. You know, you're right. And having worked at the boot camp again, you see it, it's a real, it's a real test on the old brain and the stamina. You would you would think like sitting there coding, eh, geeks. Eh. It's not. It's really not. Like it, it saps your energy. And I've seen people, you, you eat. Everyone eats a lot more. It's like weight. They lose weight. It's 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 crazy just sitting there stressing out at the computer. So, it has been a learning curve for us as well as running the program to see how the health, how health and diet and staying fit and whatnot affects your output. So, it's a big takeaway for that. I actually. I watched a, uh, a, there was a talk by Rob Simington, the founder of Escape the City, um, when he launched it like seven years ago. And, and uh, he said, um, well, he launched it like 10 years ago, but he did this talk a few years after. And he said, the two most important things that he ever did to start his company was save money and do exercise. And he's like, exercise is what got him through all those hard times and kept him on the, on the straight and narrow. And obviously, he's, a, he's very analytical, and he would break things down like you've done there. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a big key. We all know that. It's in the news every day. Um, <laughs> How much does Michael Phelps eat? That's yeah. what I get asked you, all the time. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> what was your, 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 your fat uh, measure, whatever, however you measure fat? Uh, I think I was probably about like seven percent at my leanest. Jeez. Yeah. That's insane. And what are you now? <laughs> <laughs> he went swimming this morning. I was like, so did I as well, by the way, because I went in. I was like, hey, Jeff, uh, I just did a few lengths this morning. And he said, great. What did you, great. And he said, yeah, I did too. I was like, how far did you go? He said, well, my warm up was a kilometer. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. I didn't even do a kilometer my whole swim. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was, you put, put me to shame. Look, um, I'm going to open questions up to the audience. Go for it. We'll come okay, Thanks for the talk, Jeff. Uh, well, I looked at your timetable with that university or whatever. I mean, I get confused because some people say high performance people or athletes get some, you have to get up very early in the morning, five, six, whatever. Uh, 
you think getting up early is a big thing, or what time would you suggest? Uh, I think five would be too early for me. But <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, it's interesting that you raise that point because you hear a lot of. But your time to seems to say seven for some reason. On the professional swimming side, yeah, no school. Uh, but that's interesting because when you read about you know, executives out there or just really successful people, it sounds like they never sleep. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger has this like, famous video on YouTube where he preaches like, getting six hours of sleep a day. Um, honestly, like, sleep is so, so important. And I would say that if waking up at five doesn't work for you, is to find it, try to move things around in your day such that it works. I don't think it's a necessity. Um, I mean, just think about all the extremely amazing musicians out there. They produce music like three in the morning, and it's like some of their best work, you know? So I think it, it, what, it, it's what works for you, but I think their thinking there is that by doing things like exercising early in the morning, they can create more space and time throughout the day. Um, but also naturally, different people require different amounts of sleep. So for me, I need at least eight or nine hours. Um, other people, maybe six hours. So it depends. Yeah. We go one there. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, so you, you talked about consistency and process. So my question to you is, how do you deal with boredom? Boredom? Yeah. Coding. I mean, I spend a lot of time looking at the black line on the bottom of a pool, so. <laughs> Um, it's, it's goals, it's, it's definitely goals, I would say. Uh, the, the greatest example is Michael Phelps. He would basically like pretty much never take a day off before he won eight gold medals in Beijing. And so it's all about on a deeper level, how you talk to yourself when you're in those situations. Uh, one frame of mind is, uh, this is extremely boring to me. It's so simple, like, I can just go through it and not even think. But sometimes, like, what if you have that thinking and the way you're doing something is not the best technique that you could do? You can always find ways to improve and tweak those things. So what Coach always used to tell us was that if you practice something that is not what you want to produce at the end of the day, when it comes to performing under pressure, because you hadn't been aware and present, even in those most boring of situations, it's going to fall apart. So I hope, does that uh, answer your question in some way? I mean, inevitably, some things are going to be more boring than others. Uh, it's just when you're in those situations, learning how to talk positively about that situation and just to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm one of the swimmers, and um, I work here at campus, and I went to Cal and swam there, and I know a lot of those guys just, like, burnt out. And so I was going to ask about if you still swim. It sounds like you do. Um, so I wanted to ask if you would come swim with me and my team or, like, do a, like come coach us one day or do a workshop or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Badass. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> they're going to they're going to freak out. I invited my friends but they were all like but we're going training. So like they wouldn't come to the talk tonight cuz like they were going training. <laughs> to be fair though, like I definitely burned out. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm sitting here today and not being a professional athlete anymore, but uh, it it happens. And I think I don't know, it can happen in not just sports as well. Yeah. In life. Yeah, in life. You see it a lot in the city. Uh, a friend of mine who was going, or someone I know, they were going to see a, they worked too hard and stuff, so they went to see a doctor. And the doctor said that this is the most common issue now with Londoners, is burnout. Common, most common, uh, it's like the new, it's the new uh, disease for, you know, for, for people that, in London, it's crazy. So, watch out. Nine to five, <laughs> and close laptop. Um, questions? Yeah, Arthur's coming. Uh, 
a lot of talk about goals and the Olympics is such a, it's almost binary black and white, it's there in the distance, it's shining, it's a huge goal to aim for. Do you think at some point, uh, you know, I'm applying this to myself and the rest of the guys in the room, there's going to be another huge goal like that, that you're suddenly going to have a vision and know what you're doing or life becomes a series of mini goals thereafter and that the Olympics is sort of a one-off in that respect? Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And I think that's why you uh, break down that massive, massive goal. But are you saying that what happens when you don't have such a huge goal? Like I'm that? saying, yes, uh, is it a series of mini goals? Or do you think at some point in your life, again, you will have something like the Olympics that pops in, obviously not the Olympics, but applying it in a different field. Um, and suddenly you'll be very black and white about what, what, what you're pointed, where, where you're pointing the direction and what the goal is. Um, it's just not there at this point in time and that is just it will come yeah i do definitely think it's a series of mini goals um because otherwise something that is maybe not as concrete like sport uh, where you have that massive event at the end um it's definitely setting yourself mini goals and by being aware and and mindful of the kinds of things that excites you uh, and that interests you it's setting small goals that will lead you somewhere. And that's why I think Oprah's uh, advice is so great, is because when you, and Neil Pasricha from The Happiness Equation, when you try to do something or look for that kind of next right move, you inevitably um, start moving down a certain path. And then from that next point that you get to, then you can maybe see one or two steps forward. And in that way, you can start to kind of build this momentum of and, and habit of like being goal oriented. Alex, hang on, Arthur's coming. The man with the mic. Um, how did you feel in the aftermath of the Olympics? So you said you'd kind of visualized how it would feel and then obviously you have this huge achievement and you come out and it's just I guess, back into normal training. How did you feel after that? For me, it... For me, it took a little bit of time to come down. Uh, it, it didn't... I didn't fall off the edge of a cliff because luckily I had some media commitments to go to. Unfortunately, my dad was sick with cancer, so I had that to deal with too. So I had, I had those... I, I, I would say maybe distractions. But the, it was actually really scary when I, something that I looked, uh, I, I viewed so highly in my life, uh, and then I just didn't feel the same way. It was really, really scary. And so what do you do in those situations? I think you can react in certain ways. One way is uh, like bottle it all up and just not to talk to anybody about it and really isolate yourself. Um, I think I did a pretty good job because I, I talked to friends about it, um, talked to family, and just, I, I, I would say I tried to stay curious about what else there was out there. Um, and it's like a grieving process, really. You go through, you feel angry and you feel really sad and you, you feel really hurt and all, all of these kinds of things. but. As my mom would tell me, like life moves on and swimming is m maybe not something that you can do your whole life. And it's just a question then of, um, as my coach used to say, like, how do, you be, how do you be an athlete in life and deal with adversity? And just remembering all those lessons that I learned kind of helped snap me back into like, okay, I can control what I can control. I just got to try, I got to try things. and. Uh, eventually, I was kind of on my way and making decisions, and I'm still not there yet, but I'm just going to keep on doing that. So that's how I would say you approach something really, really big like that, um, if that's something that you're experiencing yourself. Oh, or like, you know, making career transitions. I mean, it happens with regular career transitions as well. All of a sudden, you're really experienced at doing something, and all. All you're a junior. A, yeah, all of a sudden you're a junior and you're not doing what you don't even need to think twice about anymore. So, yeah. 
Any more questions? Yep. We got you. You got one as well? All right. I will come there just now. I think uh, you mentioned a couple of times about the focus thing. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, you can have, well, leaving social media aside, <laughs> like you can have a lot of distractions in life, a lot of temptation, whatever. How do you stay focused? For example, a good example would be through the whole boot camp or while you're training. How, how do you get that laser focus? So if I hadn't said it already, anchor yourself with goals. And one, uh, as far back as doing my GCSEs in, in high school, what I would used to do back in the day when MSN was popular, I don't know if you guys <laughs> ever used MSN, but everyone would be on MSN as soon as school ended when, when we got home, right? And for me, it was like, for a while, I was just getting home, not doing my homework, and then I would have training later. And all, all of a sudden, my homework was not getting done. And so I just realized, like, MSN is just sucking my time like Facebook does, Instagram does today. And so I just made it a point and a habit to, when I get home, I'm just not going to turn my computer on. We were in the days where, I mean, I didn't necessarily need my computer in order to do something. So I would not turn my computer on. I'd get my homework done first, prioritize uh, the things that really, really mattered. And then as a reward later, I could reward myself with social media. So I would say if you're doing something intense like the coding boot camp or uh, there's lots of distractions, find little strategies that can help you get into the zone. I've started doing this, this thing. Well, I, tr I tried. It lasted for January. Um, and, and it was great. No mobile phone on the tube. OK? Just so I'm one hour each way to work, I know, and 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 uh, yeah, and it was re it was a real it was amazing, and I deleted all social media. I still have it's great, and those little things have really worked, yeah. and I feel so much better. The social media thing, anyway, but the tube, not looking at the phone, great, just reading, no phone, and it really helps. Well, and going off of that, so set a plan for yourself when you're not when you're not going to do something. Inevitably, you have to do something else, right? So rather than just like cutting something out and then feeling empty and like you feel like you need to do something, make it a plan to like, okay, I'm going to cut out this and be really specific so that I'm going to do this and so on and so mm. forth. Yeah. Um, hi, sorry, maybe my question's a bit similar to the last, but um, obviously you're, you used to be a professional athlete and coding is pretty sedentary. Uh, do you find it's a bit, it was a bit of a challenge to basically do something where you're not use, probably using your best fit physical attributes and sometimes it's very hard to sit still for 10 hours a day coding? Mm. Uh, did you have any mechanisms to cope with that? Yeah, uh, I uh, fell back to a lesson on productivity uh, and that's basically... Um, some people say that you're only productive for 45 minutes straight at a time if you're extremely focused. So I made it a point to, uh, I'm not sure if some of my classmates have heard an alarm go off, but I would get up and walk around and do something. Uh, exercise was really important. Unfortunately, during the boot camp, I found it really hard to, to find time to exercise because I was so like brain dead after every day. Um, it is fun. Yeah, <laughs> brain dead in a good way. But um, I think sometimes you need to put up with some imbalance, but only for a certain amount of time. But just you can find, I mean, I would do, I would find little, little small ways that would help. Um, like, I feel like some people made fun of me with my like laptop stand, but I bought a laptop stand so that my laptop was elevated. So I wasn't doing this all day. I have that too. And I was sitting, you know, with good posture like this, but. It's something so simple, such that if I did go try to work out, I wouldn't like injure myself or anything like that. So I, 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 I tend to get anxiety when I don't work out, and so I really miss those endorphins. But uh, it was a game of time management. How, how, if I'm too tired at the end of the day, how can I find, find some time? 
Yeah. At least you knew there was an end goal, you know, end date. Yeah, yeah. I, for that so. occasion, I knew there was an yeah. end date. So now I think as a developer going forward, I will, I think, have it a bit easier where I'm not, you know, spending so much time paying a lot of money to, you know. <laughs> yeah. We do yoga yeah. as well. Yeah. There's I, yoga. Oh, that's another point. Yeah. Um, early on in the boot camp, I was thinking to myself, like, God, no time for yoga. Like, I'm here to code. Uh, and then I slowly realized that if I went and did yoga, uh, unless there was something extremely pressing that needed my attention, I would often be pretty much 98% of the time way better off going and doing yoga and then coming back and solving the same problem very, very quickly. Because somehow it's, it's really weird. Exercise and movement just it lets, I, I don't know, the problem digests, it's like some voodoo magic and all of a sudden you come back with a new idea and just a fresh perspective. I think that's what it is. Yeah. It works, it clears the mind. Um, guys, we're up. Um, Jeff, that was absolutely amazing. Um, we could sit here, or I could definitely sit here getting really deep into the emotional side of the Olympics because it's, it's an incredible thing and for us to watch on the TV. That presentation was incredible. It was amazing. You're a great man. And thank you so much for giving up your evening for free, guys, to talk with us and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you.